Minnesota To the hills of Tennessee Across the plains of Texas From sea to shining sea From Detroit down to Houston And New York to L.A. Where there's pride in every American heart All right, so this is, of course, the big moment in American politics, the big night, and many people are, in fact, dubbing this to be the most important speech that President Donald Trump will be making, making his pitch for his re-election campaign. It'll be very interesting to see as to what issues he touches upon. We just, a little while back, heard his daughter, Ivanka Trump, who's also a senior advisor at the White House, address the nation and today and with this event will be a culmination of the Republican National Convention. Donald Trump will be accepting the nomination formally from the Republican Party to be running for the office of the President of America again. And it will be interesting to see as to what will be the pitch that he makes because this of course is an extremely a difficult time and difficult circumstances that the President faces himself with. With the coronavirus pandemic, with the economy having plummeted because of the lockdowns and also because of the race tensions that have come to the fore in the aftermath of the shootings of some black individuals by the police forces. We expect Trump to speak any moment now. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Friends, delegates, and distinguished guests, please. I stand before you tonight, honored by your support, proud of the extraordinary progress we have made together over the last four incredible years, and brimming with confidence in the bright future we will build for America over the next four years. We begin this evening our thoughts are with the wonderful people who have just come through the wrath of Hurricane Laura. We are working closely with state and local officials in Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, sparing no effort to save lives. While the hurricane was fierce, one of the strongest to make landfall in 150 years, the casualties and damage were far less than thought possible only 24 hours ago. And this is due to the great work of FEMA, law enforcement, and the individual states. I will be going this weekend. And congratulations. Thank you for that great job out there. We really appreciate it. We are one national family, and we will always protect, love, and care for each other. Here tonight are the people who have made my journey possible and filled my life with so much joy. For her incredible service to our nation and its children, I want to thank our magnificent First Lady. I also want to thank my amazing daughter, Ivanka, for that introduction, and to all of my children. Ivanka, please stand up. Thank you. And to all of my children and grandchildren, I love you more than words can express. I know my brother Robert is looking down on us right now from heaven. He was a great brother and was very proud of the job we are all doing. 
Thank you. We love you, Robert. Let us also take a moment to show our profound appreciation for a man who has always fought by our side and stood up for our values, a man of deep faith and steadfast conviction, our Vice President Mike Pence. And Mike is joined by his beloved wife, a teacher, and military mom, Karen Pence. Thank you, Karen. My fellow Americans, tonight with a heart full of gratitude and boundless optimism, I profoundly accept this nomination for President of the United States. The Republican Party, the party of Abraham Lincoln, goes forward united, determined, and ready to welcome millions of Democrats, independents, and anyone who believes in the greatness of America and the righteous heart of the American people. In a new term as president, we will again build the greatest economy in history, quickly returning to full employment, soaring incomes, and record prosperity. We will defend America against all threats and protect America against all dangers. We will lead America into new frontiers of ambition and discovery and we will reach for new heights of national achievement. We will rekindle new faith in our values, new pride in our history, and a new spirit of unity that can only be realized through love for our great country. Because we understand that America is not a land cloaked in darkness, America is the torch that enlightens the entire world. Gathered here at our beautiful and majestic White House, known all over the world as the People's House, we cannot help but marvel at the miracle that is our great American story. This has been the home of larger-than-life figures like Teddy Roosevelt and Andrew Jackson, who rallied Americans to bold visions of a bigger and brighter future. Within these walls lived tenacious generals like President Grant and Eisenhower, who led our soldiers in the cause of freedom. From these grounds, Thomas Jefferson, sent Lewis and Clark on a daring expedition to cross a wild and uncharted continent. In the depths of a bloody civil war, President Abraham Lincoln looked out these very windows upon a half-completed Washington Monument and asked God in his providence to save our nation. Two weeks after Pearl Harbor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt welcomed Winston Churchill. And just inside, they set our people on a course to victory in the Second World War. In recent months, our nation and the entire planet has been struck by a new and powerful, invisible enemy. 
Like those brave Americans before us, we are meeting this challenge. We are delivering life-saving therapies and will produce a vaccine before the end of the year or maybe even sooner. We will defeat the virus, end the pandemic, and emerge stronger than ever before. What united generations past was an unshakable confidence in America's destiny and an unbreakable faith in the American people. They knew that our country is blessed by God and has a special purpose in this world. It is that conviction that inspired the formation of our union, our westward expansion, the abolition of slavery, the passage of civil rights, the space program, and the overthrow of fascism, tyranny, and communism. This towering American spirit has prevailed over every challenge and lifted us to the summit of human endeavor. And yet, despite all of our greatness as a nation, everything we have achieved is now in danger. This is the most important election in the history of our country. Thank you. At no time before have voters faced a clearer choice between two parties, two visions, two philosophies, or two agendas. This election will decide whether we save the American dream or whether we allow a socialist agenda to demolish our cherished destiny. It will decide whether we rapidly create millions of high-paying jobs or whether we crush our industries and send millions of these jobs overseas, as has foolishly been done for many decades. Your vote will decide whether we protect law-abiding Americans or whether we give free reign to violent anarchists and agitators and criminals who threaten our citizens. And this election will decide whether we will defend the American way of life or whether we will allow a radical movement to completely dismantle and destroy it. That won't happen. At the Democrat National Convention, Joe Biden and his party repeatedly assailed America as a land of racial, economic, and social injustice. So tonight, I ask you a simple question. How can the Democrat Party ask to lead our country when it spends so much time tearing down our country? In the left's backward view, they do not see America as the most free, just, and exceptional nation on Earth. Instead, they see a wicked nation that must be punished for its sins. Our opponents say that redemption for you can only come from giving power to them. This is a tired anthem spoken by every repressive movement throughout history. But in this country, we don't look to career politicians for salvation. In America, we don't turn to government to restore our souls. We put our faith in Almighty God. Joe Biden is not a savior of America's soul. 
He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. For 47 years, Joe Biden took the donations of blue-collar workers, gave them hugs and even kisses. and told them he felt their pain. And then he flew back to Washington and voted to ship our jobs to China and many other distant lands. Joe Biden spent his entire career outsourcing their dreams and the dreams of American workers, offshoring their jobs, opening their borders, and sending their sons and daughters to fight in endless foreign wars, wars that never ended. Four years ago, I ran for president because I could not watch this betrayal of our country any longer. I could not sit by as career politicians let other countries take advantage of us on trade, borders, foreign policy, and national defense. Our NATO partners, as an example, were very far behind in their defense payments. But at my strong urging, they agreed to pay $130 billion more a year, the first time in over 20 years that they upped their payments. And this $130 billion will ultimately go to $400 billion a year. And Secretary General Stoltenberg, who heads NATO, was amazed after watching for so many years and said that President Trump did what no one else was able to do. Thank you. From the moment I left my former life behind, and it was a good life. <laughs> I have done nothing but fight for you. I did what our political establishment never expected and could never forgive breaking the cardinal rule of Washington politics. I kept my promise. <laughs> Together, we have ended the rule of the failed political class, and they are desperate to get their power back by any means necessary. You've seen that. They are angry at me because instead of putting them first, I very simply said, America first. Thank you. Days after taking office, we shocked the Washington establishment and withdrew from the last administration's job-killing Trans-Pacific Partnership. I then immediately approved the Keystone XL and Dakota Access Pipelines, ended the unfair and very costly Paris Climate Accord, and secured for the first time American energy independence. We passed record-setting tax and regulation cuts at a rate nobody had ever seen before. Within three short years, we built the strongest economy in the history of the world. Washington insiders asked me not to stand up to China. They pleaded with me to let China continue stealing our jobs, ripping us off, and robbing our country blind. But I kept my word to the American people. We took the toughest, 
boldest, strongest, and hardest hitting action against China in American history by far. They said that it would be impossible to terminate and replace NAFTA. But again, they were wrong. Earlier this year, I ended the NAFTA nightmare and signed the brand new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement into law. And right now, auto companies and others are building their plants and factories in America, not firing their employees, and not deserting us for other countries. In perhaps no area did the Washington special interests try harder to stop us than on my policy of pro-American immigration. But I refuse to back down, and today America's borders are more secure than ever before. Thank you. We ended catch and release, stopped asylum fraud, took down human traffickers who prey on women and children, and we have deported 20,000 gang members and 500,000 criminal aliens. We have already built 300 miles of border wall, and we are adding 10 new miles every single week. The wall will soon be complete, and it is working beyond our wildest expectations. We are joined this evening by members of the Border Patrol Union, representing our country's courageous border agents. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Brave, brave people. You see, this country loves our law enforcement. They do. They do. They really do. Love and respect. When I learned that the Tennessee Valley Authority laid off hundreds of American workers and forced them to train their lower-paid foreign replacement, I promptly removed the chairman of the board and now those talented American workers have been rehired and are back providing power to Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, and Virginia. They have their old jobs back, and some are here with us this evening. Please stand. You went through a lot. Please stand. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've been through a lot. Thank you very much. Last month, I took on Big Pharma. You think that's easy? It's not. <laughs> and signed orders that will massively lower the cost of your prescription drugs and give critically ill patients access to life-saving cures. We passed the decades long awaited right to try, right to try. We also passed VA accountability and VA choice. Our great veterans, we're taking care of our veterans. 91% approval rating this month, the VA given by our veterans. First time anything like that's ever happened. By the end of my first term, we will have approved more than 300 federal judges, including two great new Supreme Court justices.
and to bring prosperity to our forgotten inner cities. We worked hard to pass historic criminal justice reform, prison reform, opportunity zones, and long-term funding of historically black colleges and universities. And before the China virus came in, produced the best unemployment numbers for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Asian Americans ever recorded. And I say very modestly that I have done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln, our first Republican president. And I have done more in three years for the black community than Joe Biden has done in 47 years. And when I'm reelected, the best is yet to come. When I took office, the Middle East was in total chaos. ISIS was rampaging, Iran was on the rise, and the war in Afghanistan had no end in sight. I withdrew from the terrible, one-sided Iran nuclear deal. Unlike many presidents before me, I kept my promise recognized Israel's true capital, and moved our embassy to Jerusalem. But not only did we talk about it as a future site, we got it built. Rather than spending $1 billion on a new building as planned, we took an already-owned existing building in a better location. Real estate deal, right? (laughs) And opened it at a cost of less than $500,000. Many things like that that government is doing right now. We also recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. And this month, we achieved the first Middle East peace deal in 25 years. Thank you to UAE. Thank you to Israel. In addition, we obliterated 100% of the ISIS caliphate and killed its founder and leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Then, in a separate operation, we eliminated the world's number one terrorist by far, Qasim Soleimani. (laughs) Unlike previous administrations, I have kept America out of new wars, and our troops are coming home. We have spent nearly $2.5 trillion on completely rebuilding our military, which was very badly depleted 
when I took office, as you know, this includes three separate pay raises for our great warriors. We also launched the Space Force, the first new branch of the United States military since the Air Force was created almost 75 years ago. We have spent the last four years reversing the damage Joe Biden inflicted over the last 47 years. Biden's record is a shameful roll call of the most catastrophic betrayals and blunders in our lifetime. He has spent his entire career on the wrong side of history. Biden voted for the NAFTA disaster, the single worst trade deal ever enacted. He supported China's entry into the World Trade Organization, one of the greatest economic disasters of all time. After those Biden calamities, the United States lost one in four manufacturing jobs. We laid off workers in Michigan, Ohio, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and many other states. They didn't want to hear Biden's hollow words of empathy. They wanted their jobs back. As vice president, he supported the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have been a death sentence for the U.S. auto industry. He backed the horrendous South Korea trade deal, which took many jobs from our country and which I've reversed and made a great deal for our country. He repeatedly supported mass amnesty for illegal immigrants. He voted for the Iraq war. He opposed the mission to take out Osama bin Laden. He opposed killing Soleimani. He oversaw the rise of ISIS and cheered the rise of China as a positive development for America and the world. Some positive development. That's why China supports Joe Biden and desperately wants him to win. I can tell you that upon very good information. <laughs> China would own our country if Joe Biden got elected. Unlike Biden, I will hold them fully accountable for the tragedy that they caused all over the world, they caused. In recent months, our nation and the world has been hit by the once-in-a-century pandemic that China allowed to spread around the globe. They could have stopped it, but they allowed it to come out. We are grateful to be joined tonight by several of our incredible nurses and first responders. Please stand and accept our profound Thanks and gratitude. Many Americans, including me, have sadly lost friends and cherished loved ones to this horrible disease. As one nation, we mourn, we grieve, and we hold in our hearts forever the memories of all of those lives that have been so tragically taken, so unnecessary. In their honor, we will unite. In their memory, we will overcome. And when the China virus hit, we launched the largest national mobilization since World War II. Invoking the Defense Production Act, we produce the world's largest supply of ventilators. Not a single American who has needed a ventilator has been denied a ventilator, which is a miracle. Good job heading the task force by our great Vice President. Thank you very much, Mark. Please, please stand up. We shipped hundreds of millions of masks, gloves, and gowns to our frontline healthcare workers. To protect our nation's seniors, we rushed supplies, testing kits, and personal 
to nursing homes. We gave everything you can possibly give, and we're still giving it because we're taking care of our senior citizens. The Army Corps of Engineers built field hospitals, and the Navy deployed our great hospital ships. We developed from scratch the largest and most advanced testing system anywhere in the world. America has tested more than every country in Europe put together, and more than every nation in the Western Hemisphere combined. Think of that. We have conducted 40 million more tests than the next closest nation, which is India. We developed a wide array of effective treatments, including a powerful antibody treatment known as convalescent plasma. You saw that on Sunday night when we announced it, that will save thousands and thousands of lives. Thanks to advances, we have pioneered the fatality rate. And you look at it, and you look at the numbers, it has been reduced by 80 percent since April, 80 percent. The United States has among the lowest case fatality rates of any major country anywhere in the world. The European Union's case fatality rate is nearly three times higher than ours, but you don't hear that. They don't write about that. They don't want to write about that. They don't want you to know those things. Altogether, the nations of Europe have experienced a 30 percent greater increase in excess mortality than the United States. Think of that. We enacted the largest package of financial relief in American history. Thanks to our Paycheck Protection Program, we have saved or supported more than 50 million American jobs. That's one of the reasons that we're advancing so rapidly with our economy. Great job. As a result, we have seen the smallest economic contraction of any major Western nation, and we are recovering at a much faster rate than anybody. Over the past three months, we have gained over 9 million jobs, and that's a record in the history of our country. <laughs> Unfortunately, from the beginning, our opponents have shown themselves capable of nothing but a partisan ability to criticize. When I took bold action to issue a travel ban on China, very early indeed, Joe Biden called it hysterical and xenophobic. And then I introduced a ban on Europe very early again. If we had listened to Joe, hundreds of thousands more Americans would have died. Instead of following the science, Joe Biden wants to inflict a painful shutdown on the entire country. His shutdown would inflict unthinkable and lasting harm on our nation's children families, and citizens of all backgrounds. The cost of the Biden shutdown would be measured in increased drug overdoses, depression, alcohol addiction, suicides, heart attacks, economic devastation, job loss, and much more. Joe Biden's plan is not a solution to the virus, but rather it's a surrender to the virus. My administration has a very different approach. To save as many lives as possible, we are focusing on the science, the facts, and the data. We are aggressively sheltering those at highest risk, especially the elderly, while allowing lower-risk Americans to safely return to work and to school. And we want to see so many of those great states be open by Democrats. We want them to be open. They have to be open. They have to get back to work. They have to get back to work, and they have to get back to school. Most importantly, we are marshalling America's scientific genius to produce a vaccine in record time. Under Operation Warp Speed, we have three different vaccines in the final stage of trials. Right now, years ahead of what has been achieved before. Nobody thought it could ever be done this fast. Normally, it would be years, and we did it in a matter of a few months. We are producing them in advance so that hundreds of millions of doses will be quickly available. We will have a safe and effective vaccine this year, and together, we will crush the virus.
At the Democrat convention, you barely heard a word about their agenda. But that's not because they don't have one. It's because their agenda is the most extreme set of proposals ever put forward by a major party nominee. Joe Biden may claim he is an ally of the light, but when it comes to his agenda, Biden wants to keep us completely in the dark. He doesn't have a clue. He has pledged a $4 trillion tax hike on almost all American families, which will totally collapse our rapidly improving economy and, once again, record stock markets that we have right now will also collapse. That means your 401ks. That means all of the stocks that you have. On the other hand, just as I did in my first term, I will cut taxes even further for hardworking moms and dads. I will not raise taxes. I will cut them, and very substantially. And we will also provide tax credits to bring jobs out of China back to America, and we will impose tariffs on any company that leaves America to produce jobs overseas. We will make sure our companies and jobs stay in our country, as I've already been doing for quite some time, if you've noticed. Joe Biden's agenda is made in China. My agenda is made in the USA. Biden has promised to abolish the production of American oil, coal, shale, and natural gas, laying waste to the economies of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Texas, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Colorado, and New Mexico, destroying those states, absolutely destroying those states and others. Millions of jobs will be lost, and energy prices will soar. These same policies led to crippling power outages in California just last week. Everybody saw that. Tremendous power outage. Nobody's seen anything like it, but we saw that last week in California. How can Joe Biden claim to be an ally of the light when his own party can't even keep the lights on? Joe Biden's campaign has even published a 110-page policy platform. You can't get away from this. Co-authored with far-left Senator Crazy Bernie Sanders. The Biden-Bernie manifesto calls for suspending all removals of illegal aliens, implementing nationwide catch and release, and providing illegal aliens with free, taxpayer-funded lawyers. Everybody gets a lawyer. Come on over to our country. Everybody has a lawyer. We have a lawyer for you. That's what we need is more lawyers. <laughs> Joe Biden recently raised his hand on the debate stage and promised to your giveaway. He was going to give it away, your health care dollars to illegal immigrants, which is going to bring massive number of immigrants into our country. Massive numbers will pour into our country in order to get all of the goodies that they want to give, education, health care, everything. He also supports deadly sanctuary cities that protect criminal aliens. He promised to end national security travel bans from jihadist nations, and he pledged to increase refugee admissions by 700 percent. This is in the manifesto. The Biden plan would eliminate America's borders in the middle of a global pandemic. And he's even talking about taking the wall down. How about that? <laughs> Biden also vowed to oppose school choice and close all charter schools, ripping away the ladder of opportunity for black and Hispanic children. In a second term, I will expand charter schools and provide school choice to every family in America.
And we will always treat our teachers with the tremendous respect that they deserve. Great people. Great, great people. Joe Biden claims he has empathy for the vulnerable, yet the party he leads supports the extreme late-term abortion of defenseless babies right up until the moment of birth. Democrat leaders talk about moral decency, but they have no problem with stopping a baby's beating heart in the ninth month of pregnancy. Democrat politicians refuse to protect innocent life, and then they lecture us about morality and saving America's soul. Tonight, we proudly declare that all children, born and unborn, have a God-given right to life. During the Democrat convention, the words, under God, were removed from the Pledge of Allegiance. Not once, but twice. We will never do that. But the fact is, this is where they're coming from. Like it or not, this is where they're coming from. If the left gains power, they will demolish the suburbs, confiscate your guns, and appoint justices who will wipe away your Second Amendment and other constitutional freedoms. Biden is a Trojan horse for socialism. If Joe Biden doesn't have the strength to stand up to wild-eyed Marxists like Bernie Sanders and his fellow radicals, and there are many, there are many, many, we see them all the time, it's incredible, actually, then how is he ever going to stand up for you? He's not. The most dangerous aspect of the Biden platform is the attack on public safety. The Biden-Bernie manifesto calls for abolishing cash bail, immediately releasing 400,000 criminals onto the streets and into your neighborhoods. When asked if he supports cutting police funding, Joe Biden replied, yes, absolutely. When Congresswoman Ilhan Omar called the Minneapolis Police Department a cancer that is rotten to the root, Biden wouldn't disavow her support and reject her endorsement. He proudly displayed it shortly later on his website. Displayed it in big letters. Make no mistake, if you give power to Joe Biden, the radical left will defund police departments all across America. They will pass federal legislation to reduce law enforcement nationwide. They will make every city look like Democrat-run Portland, Oregon. No one will be safe in Biden's America. My administration will always stand with the men and women of law enforcement. Every day, police officers risk their lives to keep us safe. And every year, many sacrifice their lives in the line of duty. One of these incredible Americans was Detective Miostas Familia. She was part of a team of American heroes called the NYPD, or New York's Finest, who I was very, very proud to get their endorsement just the other day. Great people, great, great people. They were allowed to do their job. You'd have no crime in New York. Rudy Giuliani knows that better than anybody. Thank you, Rudy. Three years ago, on the 4th of July weekend, Detective Familia was on duty in her vehicle when she was ambushed just after midnight and murdered by a monster who hated her purely for wearing the badge. Detective Familia was a single mom, she recently asked for the night shift so she could spend more time with her kids. Two years ago, I stood in front of the U.S. Capitol alongside those beautiful children and held their grandmother's hand as they mourned their terrible loss 
And we honored Detective Familia's extraordinary life. It was extraordinary. Detective Familia's three children are with us this evening. Genesis, Peter, Delilah, we are so grateful to have you here tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I promise you that we will treasure your mom in our memories forever. We must remember that the overwhelming majority of police officers in this country, and that's the overwhelming majority, are noble, courageous, and honorable. We have to give law enforcement, our police, back their power. They are afraid to act. They are afraid to lose their pension. They are afraid to lose their jobs. And by being afraid, they are not able to do the job that they so desperately want to do for you. And those who suffer most are the great people who they protect and who they want to protect at an even higher level. When there is police misconduct, the justice system must hold wrongdoers fully and completely accountable, and it will. But when we can never have a situation where things are going on as they are today, we must never allow mob rule. We can never allow mob rule. In the strongest possible terms, the Republican Party condemns the rioting, looting, arson, and violence we have seen in Democrat-run cities all, like Kenosha, Minneapolis, Portland, Chicago, and New York, and many others, Democrat-run. There is violence and danger in the streets of many Democrat-run cities throughout America. This problem could easily be fixed if they wanted to. Just call. We're ready to go in. We'll take care of your problem in a matter of hours. Just call. We have to wait for the call. It's too bad we have to, but we have to wait for the call. We must always have law and order. All federal crimes are being investigated, prosecuted, and punished to the fullest extent of the law. When the anarchists started ripping down our statues and monuments right outside, I signed an order immediately. Ten years in prison. And it was a miracle. It all stopped. No more statues. They said, that's just too long, as they looked at a statue. I think we'll rip it down. Then they said, 10 years in prison. I think that's too long. Let's go home. During their convention, Joe Biden and his supporters remained completely silent about the rioters and criminals spreading mayhem in Democrat-run cities. They never even mentioned it during their entire convention. Never once mentioned. Now they're starting to mention it because their poll numbers are going down like a rock in water. It's too late, Joe. In the face of left-wing anarchy and mayhem in Minneapolis, Chicago, and other cities, Joe Biden's campaign did not condemn it. They donated to it. At least 13 members of Joe Biden's campaign staff donated to a fund to bail out vandals, arsonists, anarchists, looters, and rioters from jail. Here tonight is the grieving family of retired police captain David Dorn, a 38-year veteran of the St. Louis Police Department, a great man and a highly respected man by all. In June, Captain Dorn was shot and killed as he tried to protect his store from rioters and looters, or as the Democrats would call them, peaceful protesters. They call them peaceful protesters. We're honored to be joined tonight by his wonderful wife, Anne, and beloved family members, Brian and Kaylin. To each of you, we will never forget the heroic legacy of Captain David Dorn. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Great man. Great man. As long as I am president, we will defend the absolute right of every American citizen to live in security, dignity, and peace. If the Democrat Party wants to stand with anarchists, agitators, rioters, looters, and flag burners, that is up to them. But I, as your president, will not be a part of it. The Republican Party will remain the voice of the patriotic heroes who keep America safe and salute the American flag. Last year, over 1,000 African Americans were murdered as a result of violent crime in just four Democrat-run cities. The top 10 most dangerous cities in the country are run by Democrats and have been for many decades. Thousands more African Americans are victim and victims of violent crime in these communities. Joe Biden and the left ignore these American victims. I never will. If the radical left takes power, they will apply their disastrous policies to every city, town, and suburb in America. Just imagine if the so-called peaceful demonstrators in the streets were in charge of every lever of power in the U.S. government. Just think of that. Liberal politicians claim to be concerned about the strength of American institutions. But who exactly is attacking them? Who is hiring the radical professors, judges, and prosecutors? Who is trying to abolish immigration enforcement and establish speech codes designed to muzzle dissent? In every case, the attacks on American institutions are being waged by radical left. Always remember, they are coming after me because I am fighting for you. That's what's happening. And it's been going on from before I even got elected. And remember this. They spied on my campaign, and they got caught. Let's see now what happens. We must reclaim our independence from the left's repressive mandates. Americans are exhausted trying to keep up with the latest lists of approved words and phrases and the ever more restrictive political decrees. Many things have a different name now, and the rules are constantly changing. The goal of cancel culture is to make decent Americans live in fear of being fired, expelled, shamed, humiliated, and driven from society as we know it. The far left wants to coerce you into saying what you know to be false and scare you out of saying what you know to be true. It's very sad. But on November 3rd, you can send them a very thundering message they will never forget. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joe Biden is weak. He takes his marching orders from liberal hypocrites who drive their cities into the ground while fleeing far from the scene of the wreckage. These same liberals want to eliminate school choice while they enroll their children in the finest private schools in the land. They want to open our borders while living in Waldorf compounds and communities in the best neighborhoods in the world. They want to defund the police while they have armed guards for themselves. 
This November, we must turn the page forever on this failed political class. The fact is, I'm here. What's the name of that building? But I'll say it differently. The fact is, we're here, and they're not. <laughs> to me, one of the most beautiful buildings anywhere in the world, and it's not a building, it's a home, as far as I'm concerned. Not even a house, it's a home. It's a wonderful place with an incredible history. But it's all because of you. Together, we will write the next chapter of the great American story. Over the next four years, we will make America into the manufacturing superpower of the world. We will expand opportunity zones. Thank you, Tim Scott. Bring home our medical supply chains, and we will end our resilience. For bad things, we will go right after China we will not rely on them one bit. We're taking our business out of China. We are bringing it home. We want our business to come home. We will continue to reduce taxes and regulations at levels not seen before. We will create 10 million jobs in the next 10 months. And it'll be higher than that. We will hire more police, increase penalties for assaults on law enforcement, and surge federal prosecutors into high-crime communities. We will ban deadly sanctuary cities and ensure that federal health care is protected for American citizens, not for illegal aliens. We will have strong borders. And I've said for years, without borders, we don't have a country. Don't have a country. Strike down terrorists to threaten our people and keep America out of endless and costly foreign wars. We will appoint prosecutors, judges, justices who believe in enforcing the law, not enforcing their own political agenda, which is illegal. We will ensure equal justice for citizens of every race religion, color, and creed. We will uphold your religious liberty and defend your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And if we don't win, your Second Amendment doesn't have a chance. I can tell you that. I have totally protected it. We will protect Medicare and Social Security. We will always and very strongly protect patients with pre-existing conditions. And that is a pledge from the entire Republican Party. Thank you, Kevin. We will end surprise medical billing require price transparency and further reduce the cost of prescription drugs and health insurance premiums. They're coming way down. We will greatly expand energy development, continuing to remain the number one in the world and keep America energy independent. And for those of you that still drive a car, look how low your gasoline bill is. You haven't seen that in a long time. We will win the race to 5G and build the world's best cyber and missile defense already under construction. We will fully restore patriotic education to our schools and always protect we will always, always protect free speech on college campuses. And we put a very big penalty in 
they do anything having to do with your free speech, colleges have to pay a tremendous, tremendous financial penalty. And again, it's amazing how open they've been lately. We will launch a new age of American ambition in space. America will land the first woman on the moon, and the United States will be the first nation to plant its beautiful flag on Mars. This is the unifying national agenda that will bring our country together. So tonight, I say to all Americans, this is the most important election in the history of our country. There has never been such a difference between two parties or two individuals in ideology, philosophy, or vision than there is right now. Our opponents believe that America is a depraved nation. We want our sons and daughters to know the truth. America is the greatest and most exceptional nation in the history of the world. Our country wasn't built by cancel culture, speech codes, and soul-crushing conformity. We are not a nation of timid spirits. We are a nation of fierce, proud, and independent American patriots. We are a nation of pilgrims, pioneers, adventurers, explorers, and trailblazers who refuse to be tied down, held back, or in any way reined in. Americans have steel in their spines, grit in their souls, and fire in their hearts. There is no one like us on Earth. I want every child in America to know that you are part of the most exciting and incredible adventure in human history. No matter where your family comes from, no matter your background in America, anyone can rise. With hard work, devotion, and drive, you can reach any goal and achieve every ambition. Our American ancestors sailed across the perilous ocean to build a new life on a new continent. They braved the freezing winters, crossed the raging rivers, scaled the rocky peaks, trekked the dangerous forests, and worked from dawn till dusk. These pioneers didn't have money. They didn't have fame. But they had each other. They loved their families. They loved their country. And they loved their God. When opportunity beckoned, they picked up their Bibles, packed up their belongings, climbed into their covered wagons, and set out west for the next adventure. Ranchers and miners, cowboys and sheriffs, farmers and settlers, they pressed on past the Mississippi to stake a claim in the wild frontier. Legends were born. Wyatt Earp, Annie Oakley, Davy Crockett, and Buffalo Bill. Americans built their beautiful homesteads on the open range. Soon they had churches and communities, then towns, and with time, great centers of industry and commerce. That is who they were. Americans build their future. We don't tear down our past. We are the nation that won a revolution toppled tyranny and fascism, and delivered millions into freedom. We laid down the railroads, built the great ships, raised up the skyscrapers, revolutionized industry, and sparked a new age of scientific discovery. We set the trends in art and music, radio and film, sport and literature, and we did it all with style and confidence and flair, because that is who we are. Whenever our way of life was threatened, our heroes answered the call. 
from Yorktown to Gettysburg, from Normandy to Iwo Jima. American patriots raced into cannon blasts, bullets, and bayonets to rescue American liberty. They had no fear, but America didn't stop there. We looked into the sky and kept pressing onward. We built a six million pound rocket and launched it thousands of miles into space. We did it so that two brave patriots could stand tall and salute our wondrous American flag planted on the face of the moon. For America, nothing is impossible. Over the next four years, we will prove worthy of this magnificent legacy. We will reach stunning new heights, and we will show that the world, for America, there is a dream, and it is not beyond your reach. Together, we are unstoppable. Together, we are unbeatable, because together, we are the proud citizens of the United States of America. And on November 3rd, we will make America safer. We will make America stronger. We will make America prouder. And we will make America greater than ever before. I am very, very proud to be the nominee of the Republican Party. I love you all. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. All right, so that was President Donald Trump there with his acceptance speech, running for the presidency of the United States of America yet again, stating that he, in his second term, intends to make America greater than ever before that it has been in the past and as expected he touched upon several things and this of course is the fireworks that that was promised as soon as Donald Trump has ended his speech that has now gone up and it's an important speech many have dubbed it as perhaps the most important speech that Donald Trump has given in his life he touched upon several aspects of his presidency he as was expected uh, launched a scathing attack on his rival, Joe Biden, the man that he'll be taking on in the election stated in the month of November. Now, it remains to be seen as to how the American public, of course, views all of this. Now, remember, this is an election that is taking place at an extremely uh, difficult time. Six months ago, things were very different. But in the aftermath of the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic, many people would, of course, think that that has hampered the chances of Donald Trump getting re-elected but how is the American public viewing all of this? The polls suggest that Joe Biden, of course, is ahead. Donald Trump said that, look, Joe Biden, if he had been in power, would have actually made America fare far worse than what has happened under his tenure in the last six odd months in his handling of the coronavirus crisis. He also went on to state that if Joe Biden had been around the coronavirus crisis would have been a much bigger problem, and that is, is something that is, is something that the American people, of course, would go on to judge him on. And he also very briefly touched upon the unrest of the racial fault lines that is unfolding in the United States of America, and that that of course is a huge, huge issue. That that is a burning issue that has taken over American society in the last several months. And it is an issue that will be in the center of how the people of America vote, whether it will be in favor of Donald Trump, whether it will go against the president is something that remains to be seen. But what he has said is that he wants a very quick recovery as soon as the coronavirus pandemic ends. He also went on to state that he would like to add 10 million jobs over the course of the next 10 months. So it's made a few promises. He also said that he would like to put um, a woman in on, on to moon. He wants the United States to send the first woman to moon and 
a whole host of different promises, of course, have been made by President Trump. But has he said enough and has he done enough to get re-elected, of course, is the big question. And to give us more insights into how all of this will, of course, play out, we are joined in by Jagruti Dave. She's joining us live from Washington, D.C. and has been tracking the events very closely for us. Uh, good, e good evening to you, Jagruti. This is, of course, the acceptance speech. So President Donald Trump has formally accepted uh, the nomination from the Republican Party to be running for the office of the President of the United States of America. It was a fairly a long speech, lasting almost about 70-odd minutes. And as expected, he launched a scathing attack on his rival, Joe Biden. But he said Joe Biden is not the person who is fit to be the President of America. He also, of course, went on to state that if Joe Biden had been in power, then America would have fared far worse in this crisis of coronavirus. Attacking his rival, Joe Biden. He said that Joe Biden is not the savior of America's soul. He is the destroyer of America's jobs. And if given the chance, he will be the destroyer of American greatness. He really is casting himself as the man who is going to make America great again, despite uh, the uh, dis despite the many problems that America is facing right now. He is very much painting Joe Biden as um, in the thrall of the left of his party. The, the the description of Joe Biden as a Trojan horse is one we've heard now a couple uh, many many times from a variety of different speakers. Um, we're hearing that he is going to be soft on China. There's a lot of his attack, the president's attacks on China go hand in hand with his attacks on Joe Biden. Both campaigns are using China to attack each other. Um, and and this, is, this is the common refrain that we've heard uh, in the Democrat convention. Now we're hearing it from the Republican side. We're going to hear it throughout the campaign. Absolutely indeed. And, and just to dwell a bit more, he said that under Joe Biden, it would be make in China. But what he now intends to do as the president of the United States is to actually manufacture things in the United States and make in the USA is, is of course, going to be his, his leading slogan, so to put it. Uh, do you think his scathing attack on Joe Biden now would have convinced the voters in America that despite the challenges that he has faced in his presidency, especially in the last six, eight months, that he perhaps is a better man to be in charge of affairs than Joe Biden. Well, this this uh, claim that um, the president is um, going is pushing the made in, made in the U.S. Uh, and Biden is uh, all about made in China. I mean, this bringing back U manufacturing back to the U.S. or developing U.S. manufacturing, again, is something that both campaigns are working on. Joe Biden launched his sort of economic pledge, economic plan, which also is sort of a... a uh, a kind of a rival to President Trump's um, America First strategy. Uh, and so again, there are actually interestingly many parallels that both campaigns are working on and they're using similar arguments, again, like the attacks on China and the focus on US manufacturing to try and draw in American voters. It just remains to be seen which argument the voters believe in, which party the voters believe are going to fulfill that pledge most effectively. Absolutely, indeed. And also, he spoke at length about many things that he had done. Uh, he said that there can be no nation without borders. He said that he's built about 300 miles of walls. And, um, you know, uh, how, how much of an impact is this likely to have on the American psyche? Because remember, one of the things that he had made a huge issue during his first campaign was about building that wall with Mexico. But that clearly has not really materialized in the way that Trump would have wanted. Look at these arguments on immigration, on the border wall, on China, on attacking the Democrats as socialists, all of these play very well into the president's base of support. His base love these arguments and they're going to back the president no matter what. The question is whether those Americans who are undecided are going to be swayed by those arguments, whether they care enough about the, the border wall as an issue um, that will make them go, I want to vote for Donald Trump over Joe Biden. Um, he... It, it, it's throughout the Republican convention, both parties have tried to bring in 
people from, you know, claim that they are a broad party, that they are um, a broad church and try to bring in a variety of people into their fold. Both parties are trying to appeal to African-American voters, Latin, uh, vo uh, 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 Latinx voters, Asian-Americans, and using different arguments to do so. Um, it's, it will be interesting to see if the, these arguments that the president uses for his base can really uh, can really reach out to the broader Republicans. Remember, there are many Republicans who have come out and said they cannot vote for Donald Trump, they will not vote for him, and that they are backing Joe Biden instead. Really significant Republican figures like uh, former Secretary of State Colin Powell, for example. So, you know, it, it depends on how many of people like that and those numbers, uh, whether that is going to make an impact or not when it comes to uh, November's election. Absolutely indeed. And one of the persons who has in fact been tweeting even as the president was speaking was his rival Joe Biden where he said, remember every example of violence Donald Trump decries has happened in his what? Under his leadership during his presidency. He's quite clearly referring to the unrest that the United States is witnessing. Now, President Trump, when he gave his address, he said that he has done more for the blacks of America, for the African-American community, since any president since the time of Abraham Lincoln. You know, what kind of resonance is this likely to have within the African-American community, especially considering the strained relations that we are looking to play out on the streets of America? Yes, exactly. This is a refrain that um, President Trump, uh, a comment that President Trump has repeatedly said. Um, and, uh, you know, you must remember that uh, Joe Biden uh, has a lot of support from the African-American community. Indeed, they took him through the primaries when he had the really bad first start um, in uh, in the New Hampshire primaries and the Iowa primaries where we uh, it looked like Joe Biden wasn't going to make it. It was uh, in the states in the South um, and the African-American communities there who really uh, boosted his profile and actually kind of helped him uh, to end up being the nominee for the Democratic Party. So um, that is something that uh, the Re Republicans are clearly aware of. And we heard from a lot of African-Americans, uh, voices who uh, came out in support of Donald Trump, um, clearly uh, tr to try and show that he does have some support in, in, those, in that demographic. And, to, and it'll be interesting to see how that resonates. Look, the protests as much as they are about um, about race, the argument that the president is making mm -hmm. is um, really about the law and order. He is really pushing um, the fact that the the pro he is casting protesters as violent mobs, and he is saying that that is happening because of Democrat law lawmakers in those states and cities who are failing to control these protests. And now Joe Biden tweeting is is using the Democratic argument, which is to say, well, these protests are happening in Donald Trump's America. He is responsible for the violence. He is responsible for the divisions in the country. And this is the point of tension between the two. And it's how, how to how to cast, how to how to um, address these protests and how to address the racial unrest at the heart of the protests and the issue of um, police, police's use of excessive force. These are issues that are playing out in the conventions and are playing out in the campaign. Here, the president is pushing his party and his position as the president of law and order as the party of law and order. He has squarely backed um, the police and trying to claim that the Democrats are, are going to adopt policies such as defunding the police, even though Joe Biden says he doesn't support those kinds of policies. So this is a real key issue that both both parties are having to grapple with and try to convince right. voters to back them on the way they are going to handle it. Absolutely indeed. Do continue to stay on with us. It is a big night in the United States. This is an election that's been described as the point of inflection. The ceremony at the White House still continues. If we can in fact dip into some of what is happening at the White House where President Trump has just concluded his speech.
back on this. You know, a normal convention, even of a sitting president, would not normally take place at the White House, but Donald Trump has not really been apologetic about it. He, in fact, went on to describe that the White House is actually, for him, his white home. You know, weigh in on how this controversy of holding this convention is, in fact, playing out in the United States. Yes, there are a lot of people who are criticizing um, the president's use of the White House as the backdrop to the Republican National Convention, just as they have criticized Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, for um, speaking at the convention whilst on a diplomatic trip uh, to the Middle East. Now, these are all issues that are to do with the limits on federal employees um, engaging in political activities and the use of federal buildings in um, partisan political statements and events. And, and there are questions being asked about the ethics behind this. So, of course, Democrats um, have latched onto this and are hugely, hugely critical with Democrats having launched uh, an investigation into Secretary of State's Mike, Mike Pompeo's appearance as a sitting Secretary of State at a political conference. Um, so, I mean, it'll be, uh, in terms of the setting, I mean, it'll be interesting to see if ordinary voters pick up on this as an issue and whether they uh, are worried or concerned about this in the way that uh, democratic lawmakers are. But right. certainly the president's critics have really picked upon this and, and just, ex you know, just as an expression of how unprecedented it is to see the White House in the backdrop of a party convention. Absolutely indeed. And lastly, perhaps President Trump's first tenure will be judged on whether he's actually succeeded in making the lives of Americans better. His first campaign slogan had been to make America great. Now, for the second campaign, for his second term in office, he's saying that he would like to make America greater than ever before it has been in the past, for which Joe Biden, of course, has put out a tweet where he said, and I'd like to quote that to you, Donald Trump promised to be the greatest jobs president God ever created. Instead, tens of millions of Americans are out of work. Now, Trump, while he spoke a little while back, said that he would like to create 10 million jobs over the course of the next 10 months. Is this, you know, the economic track record of Donald Trump, especially in the aftermath of the coronavirus crisis and the lockdowns, is this going to be his biggest stumbling block to get re-elected? Well, President Trump, um, before the pandemic, um, was um, enjoying good uh, figures, good a good economy and good jobs figures. And this is something that uh, he and his the speakers at the convention have been using as an example of the president's record. So whenever they talk about how great things are going, they say, before the pandemic struck, this is how good things were. And so this is what the president wants to hark back to the time that he is taking credit for a lot of the uh, bene the economic benefits, um, which some argue that actually this the the economic um, uh, successes that Donald Trump enjoyed pre pandemic were um, at least in part due to the successes of his predecessor. Um, but. President Trump taking the credit for it is saying, I did this and I can do it again. And that is an argument that he and his daughter Ivanka has made, many other people have made throughout. And that is a kind of a key talking point that we're going to hear time and time again. Um, but of course, the pandemic has hit people hard. People have lost their livelihoods. People are struggling. A million more people have claimed unemployment, um, according to the latest figures. Um, and so it's in this backdrop that as people are feeling the squeeze um, due to the pandemic, right. how are they going to see, how is that going to play out in who they vote for and how are they going to see the arguments put forward by both candidates on, you know, on jobs and the economy? Who do they trust? Who do they want? Who do they believe will take them out of the difficulty, difficult times that they're facing right now? Absolutely indeed. These are difficult times and these, of course, are very important times in American politics. Thank you very much indeed, Jagrati Dewey, for joining us and getting us all those insights on what is effectively one of the most important political nights in American politics. A point of inflection is how Kamala Harris has described it. It remains to be seen as to how the American electorate will decide in the election that will take place in the month of November, just a couple of months away from now. We'll, of course, be tracking the developments as they happen, but let's, for the time being, shift our attention to the other big story that we are tracking that has again come in from America. And this is about a hurricane. We'll be getting you all the latest details. But for the time being, we'll slip into a short break now. More news and updates will continue on the other side. Stay tuned to be on.